Hi everyone. Let's move on to chapter eight, which encompasses water and minerals. So looking at cellular levels of fluids, of water and minerals, it's important that these two components function in bodily fluids and they perform other functions in the body and we'll see that with each individual mineral. Water comes from three sources. So we have fluids in the diet and then fruits and vegetables. The AI, which is the adequate intake for water, is 13 cups for men and nine cups per women per day. So when we look at fruits and vegetables, lettuce and cucumber have the highest fluid intake, followed by tomatoes and watermelon. Just to note that ATI measures uh, fluid requirements in terms of liters. So females requiring 2.2 liters of fluids and males three liters per day. So it's important to note that water is a nutrient in the body. It adds structure to the cells and it can be found intracellular, extracellular, or interstitial. So what is the difference between those three? Intracellular is inside the cell. Extracellular is outside the cell. And interstitial is in between the cells. Important to note that water is absorbed and it is not metabolized. So before you get to the next slide, I'm going to ask you as nursing students, what are functions of water? So try to think of them before you change the slide and then we'll review those. So as I mentioned, water becomes part of the cell its cell structure. Water also regulates body temperature, and we'll see that in certain diseases, um, especially with viruses and bacterial infections. Water also functions as a lubricant in the body and as a shock absorber. So water functions to cushion body tissues from trauma, so what about water as a solvent? So water can transport certain nutrients as in waste in the circulatory system. Water is also a source of your trace minerals. And it functions in um, a balance for bio, other biochemical reactions. The question is, how do we regulate and maintain homeostasis in the regulation of fluid in the body? Well, it's important to note that fluid in adult weight constitutes about 50 to 60 percent, while it's even higher in infants, 75 to 80. When we talk about homeostasis, the maintenance, the regulation, what part of the brain regulates thirst, hunger, and sleep function? And the answer is that hypothalamus, the hypothalamus in the brain, it's the thirst, eat, and sleep center. When we talk about excretion of fluid in the body, well, that's regulated by many of uh, the organs, the kidneys, the brain, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland. Also, there's a hormonal 
effect with antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. We'll also see um, the hormone system, which regulates renin and angiotensin. That system helps to regulate water balance in the body. So it's complicated. Regulation of fluid in the body, it's pretty complicated. It involves a lot of um, the hypothalamus and different hormones um, reacting to the water level in the body. So you might want to review the next couple slides over and over again because it is pretty intense. So let's look at what happens when the fluid in the body becomes too low. Well, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is secreted in response to high sodium levels. So when there's low fluid, there's high sodium levels in the cell. And that responds to the low blood volume or hypotension. So the kidneys come into play, conserve the water by decreasing excretion. When that, that um, sodium concentration becomes too high, the kidneys release renin, R-E-N-I-N, which is really not a hormone, but an enzyme. And renin activates angiotensin. And again, angiotensin um, is not really a hormone, but a blood protein. So that angiotensin, which I think nursing students are familiar with, that helps to raise the BP, the blood pressure, because it's known as a vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin also looks for cues from the adrenal gland to release aldosterone. And aldosterone is a true hormone. Aldosterone will work on the kidneys to decrease the sodium excretion to retain more fluid. So the goal here is fluid homo homeostasis, just like with other, other functions in the body, we talked about glucose homeostasis. And to maintain fluid balances, we have to, as nursing students, look at the imbalances that can occur. So for example, FVD or fluid volume deficit, what happens here? Well, it could be dehydration at the cellular level, vascular level, or intracellular level. You should know as nursing students what the symptoms are of FVD. So those include, um, why, does some, why does a patient get FVD? Well, usually it's from the GI tract, um, vomiting, diarrhea, high fever, um, maybe improperly used or prescribed diuretics, um, perfuse sweating, um, polyuria. Who's most at risk? Well, typically the very young and the very old. Conversely, we see fluid volume excess. So patients experience increased fluid retention, edema, and possible causes would be sodium retention. And we talked about um, quashiorcor, which is protein malnutrition versus protein calorie malnutrition as experienced in those patients with marasmus. Sometimes, like athletes, um, will drink too much during a marathon and experience water intoxication. So just remember the symptoms for kwashiorkor malnutrition, which is just protein malnutrition, adequate calories. So if you remember the pictures um, or Google pictures with kwashiorkor, usually in younger kids, they tend to be edematous, 
um, especially in their face. They have a puffy face. They experience ascites, which is increased fluid in the abdominal area. They're edematous in the lower extremities, especially in the ankles. Okay, now we're really going to get into nutrition with the microminerals. Okay, so they're mineral categories, just like vitamins. 16 essential minerals divided into two categories. So they're broken down into major and trace minerals. And the categories are just based on the amount of the mineral that's present or required in the body. So major minerals are required in daily amounts of 100 milligrams or more. Trace minerals require less of 20 milligrams or less. So as a whole, typically minerals come from either animal sources or plant sources. Um, if you follow or your patient follows a vegan diet, there is some limit, limited bioavailability, so the absorption is lower. If patients um, experience like a low nutrient dense diet from food processing, um, that results in mineral deficiencies. So as Americans, we live here in the States, most of our foods can be fortified with minerals. Um, however, of the minerals, we see an increased prevalence of deficiencies in iron, calcium, and zinc deficiencies. Our first major mineral is calcium. And just like vitamins, it's important to know the function, regulation, and especially the food sources. Not too concerned about the AIs, the um, adequate intakes for each. Um, if you need to know AIs or RDAs, I will let you know. So looking at calcium, really important mineral involved in um, bodily fluids, in the central nervous system, but primarily for um, bone structure. Calcium also functions for muscle contraction and relaxation. It's involved in blood clotting and more recently in the research for blood pressure regulation. How do we regulate calcium in the body? Well, the goal is calcium homeostasis. So involved here are hormonal reactions. I'm going to go through it with you again. Hormones can be confusing um, because there's a lot going on, increasing, decreasing, so you might want to review the slide more than once. So we start out with parathormone. That's secreted by the parathyroid gland in response to low levels of calcium. We also move vitamin D, which interestingly, for calcium regulation, it does have a hormone-like effect, even though it's a vitamin. So vitamin D, having that hormone reaction, it has an effect as what's called calcitrol. And calcitrol, with the help of vitamin D, helps to increase blood calcium levels. Calcitonin is that third hormone. It's released by these special cells of the thyroid gland. And this is in response to when the um, high calcium levels are present. So we'll talk about patients that have long-term history of low dietary calcium intake. And it, it, you would be surprised um, patients in the hospital it occurs more than we actually think. So we have to determine what levels of calcium are more affected, bone or blood. And we'll talk about that in lecture. So 
it's important to note the different symptoms. So calcium rigor um, with low blood calcium levels, you see the stiff muscles, um, or calcium tetany, which is muscle spasm. When we talked about pregnant women, I did mention that the AI for all adults to age 50 is 1,000 milligrams. Now we do increase over the age of 50 to 1,200. And of course, um, it's the same in pregnancy and lactation, except for adolescent expecting moms. So what are your best sources? Of course, dairy products, so milk, milk-based products. Um, you will find calcium-rich products in green leafy vegetables, also sardines. So any of the smaller fish that have bones. We also are lucky that we can fortify calcium in certain foods like tofu, um, calcium-fortified orange juice, legumes, and we'll talk about a little bit later a case study that we have for lactose intolerant patients. So in lecture, I'll be calling out certain factors that determines if there's an increase or decrease in calcium absorption. So here they are on the slide. We'll talk about lactose sufficient vitamin D, acidity of the digestive tract, binders, dietary fat, as well as a high fiber and laxative diet, excessive intake of tea, which contains tannins, having a sedentary lifestyle, and then specific drugs that may decrease um, the absorption of dietary calcium. So when we look at calcium deficiency, we know that it affects and reduces bone mineral density. So as I mentioned in previous lectures, typically we'll get a BMD of bone mineral density in women that are 55 and older. But looking at children um, during their growth spurts, any deficiency of calcium could relate in stunted growth. So reduced calcium blood and bone levels will result in osteoporosis. There are some risk factors that are modifiable, which the patient has control over and those are increasing um, dietary calcium, overall a nutrient dense diet, decreasing alcohol intake, smoking cessation, caffeine, sedentary lifestyle, those all affect um, your bone health negatively. There are unfortunately unmodifiable risk, unmodifiable risk factors for osteoporosis and those include race, so typically those that have um, like an ectomorph um, body style, which means um, they have small bones. Um, for example, like the Asian community, they tend to be at risk for osteoporosis. Um, gender, again, women are at risk for osteoporosis. And then also if you have a family history. I do wanna talk about calcium toxicity um, typically, it's if a patient increases their supplemental use of dietary calcium, and it, it could result negatively, especially in constipation, uh, renal calculi, so they could have um, kidney stones, and then also reduce, reduced absorption of iron, zinc, and other minerals. So you do not want to have your patient exceed the calcium adequate intake, which is 2,500 milligrams per day. Our next major mineral is phosphorus, and it goes hand in hand with calcium. 
in that phosphorus is found in 85% of bones and teeth as a component of that hydroxyapatite. So hydroxyapatite not only functions in bones and teeth, it also functions in um, ATP, DNA, RNA as an acid-base balance, buffer. Um, primarily, food sources come from protein-rich foods for phosphorus, so there's, that's pretty easy to remember. Our next major mineral is magnesium. So magnesium tends to get lost in food processing, unfortunately. But food sources that are rich in magnesium include your whole grains, legumes, green leafy vegetables, such as broccoli, kale, and spinach. What does magnesium do? Well, it functions, again, like calcium and phosphorus, it's structural and it's a storage function in bones. Um, you don't really hear about it that much, so it's not um, what more of a well-known vitamin, but it does play a role in nerve and muscle function, especially the heart, and it's super important in blood clotting and helps to increase your immune function. Know the symptoms of a magnesium deficiency, especially the primary ones. And then there's also secondary causes of why a patient could be experiencing magnesium deficiency. So the primary symptoms are muscle twitching. It's all about the muscles, muscle weakness, and more seriously, um, a patient may convulse. Secondary causes include vomiting and diarrhea, it's all about the GI tract. Kidney uh, renal function is involved. We also see magnesium deficiency in patients that are alcoholics um, or they have some form of malnutrition. We rarely see any magnesium toxicity, so that's good. Our next set of minerals is the electrolytes which are sodium and potassium. And these are electronically charged minerals that cause different physiological reactions to maintain that fluid homeostasis. So they're circulating in the blood, other bodily fluids, and nurses are familiar with sodium and potassium um, especially those are the lab values that we look at to ascertain um, fluid balance or cardiac function there also show um, ph balance um, the amount of water that's in the body um, and it, it travels in the blood as it, it's kind of like a, you know, metamorphosis. It could travel as acids, bases, and salts, depending on what the body needs at that time. On to the next slide. <laughs> It's important to note that the major electrolytes are, depending upon their distribution, they regulate acid-base balance. And electrolytes, I mean, why do we need them in the body? Well, they play an important role in nerve and muscle regulation. So it just depends, each mineral does serve other functions in the body, but for you to remember, um, it's important to have the um, normal levels of sodium and potassium, especially in cardiac patients, and for acid-base balance. So looking at sodium, we do see that sodium functions to maintain BP, fluid volume, and contributes to nerve impulses. The recommended 
intake per day is the adequate intake is 1500 milligrams per day or about three quarters of a teaspoon. Okay. So according to the American Heart Association and the DASH diet, which we get into a little bit later, those sources recommend 2000 milligrams per day, which is about one teaspoon of salt. Where we find sodium, well, basically table salt, um, any type of processed foods, frozen foods, canned foods, they use sodium as a preservative, so they have a longer shelf life. Um, it naturally occurs in some food, and so it's important as nurses to know where in the food supply you have sodium-rich food sources, because um, most Americans will have in, in their lifetime high blood pressure, and so if they're sodium sensitive, then they'll need to watch their sodium in their diet. Sodium deficiency, otherwise known as hyponatremia, so low levels of sodium in the blood, typically caused by diarrhea, dehydration. Knowing the symptoms are important. Um, if you think of dehydration, you experience headache, um, muscle weakness, cramps, um, maybe can't concentrate very well, appetite loss. So hyponatremia with the low blood sodium levels, actually the signs and symptoms are the same for hypernatremia when the blood levels are elevated. Um, we see it commonly in, in uh, endurance runners or marathon runners who continually drink water and they don't urinate so they're um, they don't lose the fluid that they need through sweat they don't urinate during the marathon and that results in overhydration and again we talked about some patients are going to be sodium sensitive to their diet so if they have elevated blood pressure um, some of the symptoms, of course, are elevated um, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. If it's severe enough, they experience edema and they will need to decrease their dietary sodium levels. Potassium is an important mineral, especially in cardiac function um, and neurological function. Primarily, it's a positively charged mineral and it helps to maintain fluid levels intercellular, so inside the cell. Potassium foods are extremely widespread, but make sure you focus on um, potassium rich sources in potatoes. So it could be white potatoes, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, bananas, oranges, dried fruits like apricots, um, of course, oranges, but also dairy products, and legumes. It's important to note that you can have a potassium deficiency as well as a potassium toxicity. Make sure you note the signs and symptoms and the causes. So looking at potassium deficiency, you want to focus on the cardiac issues. There's muscle cramping. I've seen patients who have had low potassium levels who are confused. They don't want to eat. And in severe cases, cardiac dysrhythmias. Causes of potassium deficiency, we usually see vomiting, um, which results in dehydration, um, overuse of diuretics, or possibly misuse of laxatives. An example of this, would be patients who have an eating disorder like anorexia nervosa. So they tend to misuse the laxatives or they buy diuretics at um, the drugstore and they take more than the recommended amount because they think that they need to lose weight. And um, we typically do EKGs on patients with anorexia and they experience cardiac dysrhythmias. In terms of 
potassium toxicity. And again, both potassium deficiency and toxicity are very similar in their symptoms and um, toxicity is also caused by dehydration. But primarily um, as dietitians and nurses, you'll see it, um, patients will abuse supplements. So they'll take too many supplements that are high in potassium or potassium alone. Um, so the symptoms we see again, muscle weakness, vomiting, um, at excessively high levels in the blood, it could lead to cardiac arrest. So that's the difference. Cardiac arrhythmias and deficiency, cardiac arrest and toxicity. We'll move on now to the trace minerals and begin with iron. I think we know that iron is responsible for oxygen distribution to hemoglobin the red blood cells, and myoglobin, which is found in the muscle cells. But it is also important in assisting enzymes in oxygen use by the cells. It's probably the widely, most widely known mineral in healthcare. We, do a, we see a lot of iron deficiency anemia across the board. How do you lose iron? Well, there's a lot of ways, but iron could be lost through tissues, urine, through sweat, um, especially in women, through bleeding and um, hemorrhaging. I want you to know the RDAs for iron, which it's very low for men because they don't menstruate, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Eight milligrams for men. Um, 18 milligrams for women, and 27 milligrams during pregnancy. So what affects, there's a lot of factors that affect iron absorption. The first, again, like I said, you can lose iron through any sort of sweating, bleeding, um, shedding of cells if the sh in the cells in the urine. Um, iron can be recycled and reused, re and that happens in the spleen and the liver. Um, there's a higher rate that is absorbed, of course, during pregnancy and especially during adolescence, during growth spurts. Let's spend a little time looking at the different food sources of iron. So this is big ATI material. We should know the difference between animal or heme iron and plant sources of iron or non-heme sources. So heme iron is readily absorbable. It's found in only animal products. So again, looking at the best food sources would start out with lean red meat, then poultry, which would be chicken or turkey, fish, um, eggs, legumes, and dairy products. Non-heme iron is found basically from plant food sources. So vegetables, um, legumes, dried fruits, um, what else? Whole grains, those are great sources of non-heme iron. So it's important, especially in the vegan diet, um, to pair those sources with complementary proteins um, so it contains all of the essential amino acids. There are certain factors that affect iron absorption. Favorably, if you consume food sources with ascorbic acid or vitamin C, it will help enhance non-heme iron absorption. Um, if you consume iron from several sources, it could be heme or non-heme, 
that helps increase absorption. So for patients that have iron deficiency anemia, these are really great tips to offer them. While there are factors that positively affect iron absorption, conversely, there are certain factors that actually inhibit iron absorption. And those include any type of binders, so acids like oxalic acid, tannins that are found in coffee or tea, excessive use of antacids, and um, those engaging in pica. So we do have um, a pretty major problem here in the U.S. Um, we especially need to screen patients um, for iron deficiency anemia, patients who are of childbearing potential, teenage girls, and young children. Iron deficiency anemia is of the microcytic anemia, so that's the type. Know the signs and symptoms. Those include um, being fatigued all the time, basically unable to work, do activities, um, impaired immune function, especially sensitivity to cold. And in children, they have developmental delays. Causes of iron deficiency anemia are all related to um, bleeding. So look, look at any type of internal bleeding with regards to GI bleeding, secondary to um, ulcers, hemorrhoids, cancer, um, women with their menses. Some of it is not severe and pretty mild, and that's typically due to um, a poor diet that lacks iron-rich foods and those engaging in pica. Our next trace mineral is zinc. And zinc, um, it does take a backseat to iron, but you should note that it is responsible for more than 200 enzymatic reactions. And it's been in the news quite frequently since COVID. University of Chicago has tested COVID patients and determined that those that tested positive for COVID have had zinc deficiency. Zinc is all related to immune function, uh, growing, and um, any zinc deficiency, which could be related to COVID, is that um, you lose your sense of taste and smell. But we look at, especially in patients that are in long-term care facilities, zinc deficiency, um, because their wounds aren't healing, their immune function is impaired as well. Knowing the RDAs for zinc, um, 11 milligrams for men, 8 milligrams for women, and 11 to 12 during pregnancy and lactation. Again, you'll find zinc-rich food sources in animal products, meat, poultry, fish, um, whole grains, legumes, and eggs. We'll talk a little bit more when we get to renal disease, but looking at zinc deficiency, any type of food that has phytic acid or phytate in it, it tends to um, reduce the absorption of dietary zinc. There's so many symptoms involved in zinc deficiency, but we talked about, especially in children, there's impaired growth um, in long-term care facilities, wound healing, um, some patients, COVID patients with zinc deficiency experience taste or smell abnormalities or lack thereof, um, especially in adults. Severe deficiency may result in um, dwarfism or hypogonadism.
one thing I want to mention is countries that only consume unleavened bread we typically will see an incidence of zinc deficiency. So unleavened bread is not a great zinc source um, because it lacks yeast. So those countries, especially in Israel, consume un unleavened bread. And in that country, we do see um, a presence and um, increased zinc deficiency. Our next trace mineral is iodine. And iodine is used for the synthesis of thyroxin the thyroid hormone that regulates metabolism. So when iodine is lacking, the thyroid tends to enlarge and it creates what's called goiter. Iodine food sources um, rich in table salt, fortified with iodine and also seafood. So make sure you check the sources, um, especially sodium sources they typically contain iodine because they're fortified with it. Iodine deficiency will reduce any type of thyroid function. Um, we typically see iodine deficiency during pregnancy, which can cause issues with the fetus. It's called creatinism. And of course, um, iodine deficiency causes goiter. Um, we usually see this in other countries because their diet will lack dietary iodine. There is um, a condition called thyrotoxicosis, and that is iodine-induced goiter which is interesting because you can get goiter from a lack of iodine, but also um, too much iodine will cause this iodine-induced goiter. Our last trace mineral is chromium. And chromium basically functions in carb metabolism. It's a constituent of glucose tolerance factor, so this small trace mineral does play a role in glucose homeostasis. Typically, chromium is found in animal-derived products, but great sources are also um, plant sources such as oatmeal. We typically do not see many cases of chromium deficiency. Um, if it does result, it is usually related to impaired glucose tolerance, um, not necessarily diabetes, but we'll see hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia. They don't have diabetes. Um, sometimes in type 2 diabetes, because they're not responsive to insulin, we'll see chromium deficiencies as well. In terms of chromium toxicity, usually found from contaminants in the environment, um, those that work in industrial settings. Um, we don't typically see it from dietary intake, but again, environmental settings. Um, in if you work in industries, um, different like the metal industries, then sometimes we will see a chromium toxicity. Okay, so that is minerals in a nutshell. Please review these um, as well as the vitamins, I would say a few times to grasp the concept. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Bye-bye.